Welcome, or welcome back to the UQ School of Architecture Architectural Technology courses. In this video, we'll be looking at facade design principles relating to sunlight, facade loads, fire, and maintenance. Daylight has two effects on internal space. We have discussed the transfer of heat in another video. However, the effect of light also brings benefits and consequences we need to deal with in terms of light. A simple, unshaded facade admits daylight indiscriminately. The way light is regulated in this instance is dealt with the properties of the glass itself. When considering the effects of daylight coming into a building, we must also consider the effects of reflected daylight or glare entering the building from outside, as well as the effects of glare and reflected light from our building affecting other buildings and public spaces. Glass can be treated with many coatings to change its performance. A surface tint can reduce the amount of visible light and heat transmitted through the glass. Reflective coatings can also divert a greater amount of heat and light away from a building. Increasingly, with society preferences moving away from reflective coatings, other surfaces, such as silkscreen patterns, can diffuse the light coming inside. Innovations in cost-effective film-based photovoltaics may also see the increased use of solar energy generation on the vertical as well as horizontal surfaces. Getting the balance right between heat gain and daylight is difficult, though with double facade and dynamic shading systems, we are seeing more and more clear glass being used to help boost the amount of daylight inside a building to reduce the amount of artificial light needed. Glazing manufacturers typically use a visible light transmission coefficient to describe the performance of their glass. In effect, a higher visible light transmission coefficient means that more daylight would be transmitted through the glass. Full penetration of daylight inside buildings is not usually desirable. External shading on a building can significantly reduce the amount of direct solar gain hitting the glass in the first place, thereby reducing the transfer of heat inside the building through the glazing assembly. External shading can also reduce the glare inside buildings and help regulate daylight inside the building, particularly for work environments requiring a lot of screen-based activity. In many instances where building orientation is not ideal, the use of active shading systems can reduce glare and heating load specific times of the day. The benefit of active systems is that for those times when the sun is not directly hitting the facade, the blinds can be fully retracted to increase the amount of daylight in a building. For east or west facing facades, this is particularly useful. The drawback of dynamic facades though, is that they are expensive to install and typically expensive to maintain. Delicate moving parts subject to harsh external conditions can also significantly reduce the lifespan of systems leading to frequent and costly repairs. With the increased use of double facades, the use of mechanical systems has become less problematic as the systems are shielded from the worst conditions and high wind, and they can be designed so that they are relatively easy to repair. Another strategy to reduce direct solar radiation hitting the facade is to use a lightweight outer facade to veil the main facade. The use of perforated metals is popular in this instance as it can be quite translucent looking out, but also quite opaque when looking in. The effect can be quite stark if a veil is used to cover an entire building, however if broken up with a pattern and with specific form, it can help buffer the climate to the main facade, particularly in hot tropical and subtropical environments. A veil across a facade can also help manage external service penetrations, which can pop out on facades in unexpected places. For buildings such as laboratories and hospitals and other highly serviced buildings, this can be a significant advantage for the longer term adaptation of the building. Though the main structure takes most of the live and dead loads imposed on a building, the secondary systems such as the facade are affected by external loads that need to be taken into account. Primary to these are the live loads imposed on a building due to the effect of wind. High wind conditions can cause different problems around a building, with the direct force of the wind tending to push on a facade, 
whereas the other side of a building, or the lee side, the wind will tend to suck the windows out as a consequence of the negative pressure. Wind dynamics can also vary significantly according to a building's location. The effect of surrounding buildings can buffer and channel winds to a building with varying consequences to the facade loadings. Typically these can only be discovered through simulations in a wind tunnel, or less effectively, through software simulations. Buildings also tend to move during their lifetime as a result of applied loads and changes to materials over time. The effect of these small movements are not always easy to see, however small movement over time can result in significant facade failure if not accounted for. Typically a concrete building structure will settle and continue to shrink over time. The external facade on the other hand often expands and shrinks more dynamically as a consequence of applied forces and thermal expansion and contraction. The detail of the joint and the incorporation of movement tolerance is needed to prevent catastrophic failure due to differential movement, which also has consequences to the way we detail for moisture ingress and capillary action. Fire in a building is perhaps the single most threat to human well-being. Being trapped in a burning building a long way from the ground requires a raft of safety strategies and systems that incorporates early detection, sprinklers and a safe means of escape. The facade plays two roles in this. The first is the management of the spread of fire through the building by the consequence of the fire jumping floor to floor. The facades need to act as a buffer at the transition between levels to ensure that the fire does not easily break the glass and then leap up and re-enter the building at a higher level. The facade also needs to be designed so that it does not contribute to the spread of fire. Facade materials need to be carefully selected to comply with regulations governing their combustibility. Alternative solutions are needed for, for facade materials that are combustible, such as timber, that usually requires an engineered solution to determine how fire will spread and how it can be managed with external systems, such as sprinklers and the like. When we design buildings, all too often we forget about how the building will be maintained. The external facade is an especially maintenance intensive building element as windows get dirty quickly and modern ceiling systems need maintenance and inspection. For higher buildings, maintenance of the external facade is usually done through a building specific designed external access system. This may be as simple as rated anchor points for service people to use ropes to repel down the face of a building to small service gantries that are lowered using cranes and rail systems. When designing external features on the building, we need to consider the reach of service personnel as well as the risk of damage to external elements as the result of collisions between service equipment and the building. Low to medium rise buildings will usually forego an expensive onboard system and rely instead on reach equipment that can be rented. In these instances, it is important to consider the overall reach capable with readily available equipment as well as the position of equipment at ground level and the ease of access of that equipment onto the site. For many complicated facades, maintenance access can be a deal breaker for the design and is something that facility managers and clients will always raise, so it's very important to consider this in the early design development phase. That concludes this video outlining facade design general principles. Be sure to check in with other videos in the series.